in the third part of this lecture on the biology and psychology of the 19th century. We're going to be looking at the difficult topic of the mismeasure of man. And this is a title that I'll explain a bit later. And the topics we're going to be talking about are eugenics and social Darwinism and intelligence testing. And we're going to be asking the difficult, fraught question of whether psychology itself is institutionally racist and has a racist past. So in the first two parts of this lecture, we looked at first the theory of natural selection and ethology, and these are largely biological disciplines. And we then looked at which evolutionary ideas have, have been of relevance to psychology, particularly early psychology, and which are still relevant today. The third part of this lecture is on the scientific racism that led to the founding of, of certain schools of psychology in the 1800s and early 1900s, and look at how psychology and this particular branch of psychology might interact with society. Now, warning at this stage, um, we're going to talk about some pretty difficult topics. There will be examples of racism uh, and criticisms of racism in the past, and I think it's important for us to address this topic. Um, and so I'm not going to I'm not going to hold back, but I hope you will um, appreciate the, the difficult, sensitive nature of these of these issues. And we really want your feedback on anything that you think we could do better or differently. So we're going to look at how psychology in the 19th century probably reflected a lot of the racist views and of parts of society at that time. And we'll focus on you know the 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 information that we have access to that I can that I can read and translate. So it's going to be you know English American society of the late 1800s. I've referred to this book by Stephen Jay Gould, and this is now a 40-year-old book called The Mismeasure of Man. And in this book, he seeks essentially to attack the very strong racism that, was, that he found in the work of the 1800s and 1900s, particularly in the measurement of people's abilities, in the measurement of, measurement of people's heads and faces, and in later development of intelligence testing throughout the 20th century. And I do recommend you read this book, but if, if you do, please be warned that um, Gould highlights some of some really strong racist language in that book from the 1800s. So just be warned about that. And if you don't want to read that book, there's some other material that we've, we've provided. We talked about Galton a fair bit in a couple of parts of this lecture. And Galton was Darwin's cousin, and he used Darwinian ideas quite a lot in his work to look at heredity and how various traits and characters are passed between families. But he's often now, despite his many contributions to science in the Victorian age, Galton is known now largely as um, the father of the eugenics movement. And the idea of eugenics is that you could use Darwinian ideas to try and improve society, improve the, the genetic inheritance of society. So he thought that, um, you know, Darwin has shown everyone that that uh, humans have evolved through processes of natural and sexual selection throughout history. And humans indeed have used artificial selection in farming and agriculture processes to, to Im improve or select among their animals. So we have cows and sheep that have been selected artificially over many hundreds or thousands of years. And we have pets, dogs and cats that have been selected relatively artificially. And in particular, in, in the case of dogs, we have you know extremely artificial selection of of dogs, dog breeds. So Galton reasoned in a similar way: if we can improve, you know, the breeds of, of livestock and and, our, and animals and pets, and if we're all connected to to animals, if if evolution applies equally to all of us, then then we could also improve human society and human genetic um, abilities and characters by a similar means of artificial selection. We could help the evolutionary process along by artificially selecting people to to reproduce, to have um, to have children, and to benefit in society. Now these ideas are probably still around today in, in some some parts of the world and maybe some parts of our own culture and and but I think these would be largely and you know, almost universally thought of as quite abhor abhorrent the idea that we could select particular people to to have children, to, to go ahead and improve, you know, improve the genetic stock of society in the future. So how did Galton get to these now very controversial conclusions? So Galton, as I said before, was an independent man, not quite of leisure. I mean, he was extremely hardworking, as far as we can tell. Um, but he did have a, an awful lot of spare time. He didn't need to earn money because he had he was independently wealthy. And the way he, he conducted his research was largely by 
um, writing letters to, to many, um, many men and women throughout society. He conducted many surveys and interviews. He collected lots of data. He's famous for saying, I think, if you can count. And, but what he meant by that was that if you can, if you can measure something, if you can count something, then that is a really good way to start understanding it. And he measured everything. I mean, literally everything. And I'll show you some examples in a bit. Um, and from all his data collection across his society, Victorian society, and across politicians and scientists and farmers and dancers and athletes and, and public schoolboys and girls, he made a lot of conclusions about human individual differences. And he probably was one of the major contributors to the science of individual differences, at least in the 1800s. So Galton collected a lot of data from various methods. And he started to also invent methods of visualizing the data. So, for example, he invented this scatter plot. So this graph you see here is um, it's a scatter plot on the x axis across is um, the, the height of children relative to their parents. On the um, y axis on the left is the height of their parents, the average height of their parents. So, you know, the, the average of the father and mother. And Darwin's plot a lot of the data there, the, the, the individual data in the in the squares of, of the graph. He just got numbers, and that's the number of, of cases he found. And so what he's doing with this this new method that he's invented is is essentially he's inventing correlation. So he's taking two things which are which should be related to each other, the, the height of you and the height of your parents, and he's correlating the two by by plotting all the data in a scatter plot and drawing a series of lines that he's used mathematical formula to connect. And so Galton invented regression and correlation in the 1800s, and he did that because he was looking at the heights of children and the heights of their parents. And so he discovered these mathematical relationships in height between parents and children. Now, Galton was um, a very eminent man of Victorian society, so he knew lots and lots of other eminent men, politicians, scientists, explorers, and so on. And he studied many of these people, so he had access to this group of people, and so he, he measured them and he, he studied them. And from studying all these eminent men, Galton concluded that many bodily and mental, importantly mental characteristics, were largely inherited. So a great man, you know, a man who has reached a great position in society, would very likely have also a great son, and perhaps a great daughter as well. And that son would also reach a great position in society. And Galton reasoned that these abilities must be inherited, they must be genetically transmitted between parents and their children. And if, if that's the case, then these abilities must also be subject to natural selection, just as his cousin Darwin made clear just a few years before. And so if great men would have great sons, and these abilities are subject to natural selection, it follows that, that weak men, or feeble-minded men as he called them, would have weak or feeble-minded sons, and that they too must be subject to natural selection. And in, in coming to these conclusions, Galton also invented the methods of twin studies that we still use today. He did some twin studies, and he also proposed a, you know, great ways of using twin studies to answer these questions about the inheritance of, of characteristics across the generations. So he thought you could take a pair of twins, say identical twins, and see how they developed, whether, and whether they were, were brought up in the same family or a different family. And he also proposed using transracial adoption studies, so taking, for example, um, a white child and a black child and, and rearing them in, in different families, families different from the skin colour, presumably, of, of the child, and using those transracial adoption studies to, to look at the contributions of nurture and nature to intellectual and physical characteristics. And Galton, another thing that Galton gave us was the, the concepts nurture and nature, or the phrase nurture and nature. So two of his major contributions to psychology then were twin studies and the phrase nurture and nature. But you can see just by proposing we should do transracial adoption studies, Galton was already assuming that there must be inherited differences in the intellectual capacities of different races. And all this work and all his proposals have been summed up, I think, in his book of Her Hereditary Genius. And he sums it up as, as in, um, in this form. He's thinking about what kind of a society should we build for the future? This is sort of his, um, his utopia, if you like. So he said, 
The best form of civilization in respect to the improvement of the race would be one in which society was not costly, where incomes were chiefly derived from professional sources and not much through inheritance, where every lad had a chance of showing his abilities and, if highly gifted, was enabled to achieve a first-class education and entrance into professional life by the liberal help of the exhibitions and scholarships which he had gained in his early youth. So this sounds quite meritocratic, you know. Um, we shouldn't rely on children inheriting lots of money from their parents. And if, if children show great abilities or giftedness, um, they should be encouraged, they should be paid, you know, they should be put through the best education and they should be put into the professional life. And we should, society should help them along the way. So this sounds actually really quite good in my in my reading that your income in your status in life should depend on your ability but but the problem is with this view of his is actually that he thought in ability mental ability was largely hereditary so in a way it doesn't really matter whether you're genuinely <laughs> genu genuinely have ability or not that a large amount of that ability he thinks comes from your parents in any case so he continued in his view of the ideal society where marriage was held in as high honour as in ancient Jewish times, where the pride of race was encouraged. Of course, I do not refer to the nonsensical sentiment of the present day that goes under that name. Where the weak could find a welcome and a refuge in celibate monasteries or sisterhoods. And lastly, where the better sort of emigrants and refugees from other lands were invited and welcomed and their descendants naturalised. So it's clear in the second half of this quote that Galton is now straying from the sort of idealistic meritoc meritocracy to principles of, of marriage and race and society. And because he thought that mental ability was largely hereditary, the consequences of his views is that he thought that, that weak-minded children, people, would, would end up in institutions, in religious institutions, that they wouldn't have children. And he thought that society should welcome the better, a better kind of, of immigrants, the better race from the better races and the better countries of the world will be welcomed into our society, given money and, and uh, status in life, and, and we would naturalise their descendants. So what started out as a meritocratic proposal has actually become rather more dark, and that we would actually be moving children into, in, moving people into institutions, um, preventing them from having their own children, and we would be bringing in races and people that we thought would be better for our society. Now, these are highly political views, and they form, you know, sort of the political basis of, of the social Darwinist movement, which is the idea that we should use Darwin's principles to improve society, improve the, you know, the, the proportion of people in society. Of course, Galton was primarily a scientist, but he was extremely well connected to political and societal figures. And so his views would have been influential on these political and societal figures. And so although he's, he's mostly talking about science in his books, he very easily strays into this political social sphere. And so they're not really scientific conclusions. They are very clearly um, political or moral or social conclusions that have been based on his scientific evidence. I think it's important to realise that Galton is not the only person who contributed these sorts of views and these sorts of data sets to, to society in the 1800s. And in fact, if you look at um, Stephen Jay Gould's book, The Mismeasure of Man, then you'll see that it was widespread from the early 1800s throughout and that many of the most successful scientists, the most successful um, academics and thinkers and philosophers had quite racist views. Um, and here's an example of something that um, that Stephen Jay Gould picked out from a man called Samuel Morton, who was um, an anthropologist and a naturalist. And he examined many skulls that had been collected around the world um, that he had access to in America. And throughout the 1800s, many skulls and things were, were collected, artifacts collected from various cultures around the world as as various countries, you know, expanded their empires and, and essentially stole things from, from many countries around the world. We gathered these things in anthropological museums and collections. And Morton went through the skulls and he found, he found a number of skulls of, for example, um, people from countries where uh, a majority of people are black, countries where people are Caucasian, 
and some Asian skulls as well, uh, particularly people from Mongolia, I think. And he looked at the size and the shape and the organisation of these skulls, and he used the average size of the skulls to come up with conclusions about which races essentially had the largest heads and therefore, you know, the most brain. And he made conclusions. So, for example, the the so quite elongated skulls of the black people with the, the jaw that sort of comes a bit further forward than the whites. And the Caucasians had more rounded skulls. And then the Asian group that he looked at, the Mongolian group, um, had very large, very large skulls indeed. So he used these apparent differences in skull size to draw direct racial conclusions about mental capacities across the different types of skulls and different types of people. And his views were well accepted. He wasn't, you know, a freak. He was funded, well accepted, and celebrated as a, you know, as a scientist. Stephen Jay Gould wrote this book called Mismeasure of Man 40 years ago now. And you can read it as an attack on the scientific and racial prejudices of scientists and anthropologists in the 1800s and throughout the 20th century. And one thing that Gould prioritises is in pointing out the poor science and the hypocrisy and the circular reasoning in much of this work. And let me give you an example. So the figure here shows six brains. On the left side are three brains from three different groups. So the top left is a large brain of a happens to be a male mathematician. Um, the middle one is uh, the brain from a female bushwoman, so a woman in, um, I believe, sub-Saharan Africa. And at the bottom left is the brain of a gorilla. I'm not sure whether that's a male or a female gorilla. I'm not, I'm not sure if that, if that matters. And so Morton and others were u- using the size of these brains to infer differences in, you know, uh, in intellectual capacity between races. And so they would say, for example, that the mathematician who came from um, a European country, they've got a large brain, the, the woman from Africa has a smaller brain, and the gorilla has an even smaller brain still. And that would lead them directly to their conclusions about the racial inheritance of intelligence. But in the very same data set, this same, same person who presented these three brains and argued for racial differences also showed three brains within the same group. So on the right side of this figure, we have three more brains. One is from a, a male general. One is from a male professor. And the one at the bottom right is a male prime minister's brain. And I think you can see that these brains have been selected for their size differences. And I don't think anyone would really conclude that the brains on the right of this pic- figure show that the male prime minister, I think it was the prime minister of France, was about as clever as a gorilla. And they wouldn't. They probably wouldn't claim that the male at the top on the right was, for sure, the male general was more clever than the prime minister. So the point about these figures is that on the left side they're using a, a, race, a racial category to describe the differences in size of these brains, and on the right side they're all from the same white male society, and yet the differences in brains are almost as large as the differences between the mathematician and the gorilla on the left. So they'd make racial conclusions from a racial ordering of of brain size, but they would make non-racial conclusions from a very similar ordering of sizes of brains on the right side. And this is this is just um, this is just wishful thinking essentially. If brain size can vary so much within a group of people, for example, white male um, Europeans, then it doesn't it can't mean much if brain size also differs between mathematicians and gorillas and also you you may notice that the middle one the only one that of these brains that comes from an african group is actually the brain of a female and it's well known that um, women are slightly smaller in size and that brain size is related to body size in general so an elephant has an enormous brain and and a mouse has a small brain and and there are systematic relationships between body size and brain size but essentially, even within a species, a larger member of a species will have a larger brain. They've got more neurons, or maybe not even more neurons, they've got larger neurons that, that need to travel larger distances in a, in a larger body. And so it's bigger. So Gould looked at these hypocrisies and circular reasoning, and he reassessed the quality of the science that was underlying the conclusions, the racial conclusions that these 
19th century scientists were making. And he concluded that it seemed to be that the racial prejudices and stereotypes were driving the interpretation of the data. It wasn't the data that was driving the interpretation, it was, it was the racial stereotypes. So racial conclusions would be made from the brains on the left side of this figure, without reference to the fact that brain size differs massively within a sex, within a, within a species, within a, within a so-called race. Now this book of Gould, The Mismeasure of Man, was a real, it was controversial because the strength of, the strength of his arguments and the, um, and the difficult topics and the, and the difficult uh, criticisms that he was making for many people in, in biological and psychological sciences, because he, he extended his criticism to cover not just the 18th and 1900s physical anthropology and biological determinism, but he also criticised intelligence testing methods throughout the 20th century. And from this critical book of Gould, something called the Darwin Wars began, and that's essentially where different groups of, of people using Darwin's work to argue for or against the inheritance of mental characteristics had a massive big fight, and, um, and it, may, it may still be going on today. Unfortunately, Gould died in 2002, so he didn't get to see many of the, much of the rest of this argument. And people have criticised Gould for his overstatement of the problem or, or his, his selection of the very worst cases from the history books. And I think I can, I can understand why he's done that. He wanted to, to point out the hypocrisies in these, in these works. And so some other scientists have gone back and they've looked at the same sets of data and they've made slightly different conclusions to Gould. And so it's probably fair to say that Gould's re-measurements may also have been a bit wrong and, and also a bit biased. Maybe he was looking too hard to support his own viewpoints. But when you read the original texts, it's, it's absolutely clear. And Gould was certainly correct that race, the racial hierarchies that were concluded by these scientists and statisticians, they, they're nothing to do with head measurements. They're nothing, to, you know, you can't use the head measurements, head measurements and brain measurements to create racial hierarchies. It just didn't work. And it was clearly biased. And it was clearly that the societal prejudices were informing the, the statistical conclusions. And further than that, he questioned the possibility and even the purpose of ever really measuring human intelligence objectively. Can we even do that? Is it even a thing which we can or should do? But the problem is that much of 20th century psychology has tried to do exactly that. So let's take a look. In the hundred years that followed um, Galton and Morton, there was a great expansion of intelligence testing in 20th century psychology. Intelligence testing began largely during the First World War and it was used to select people for different jobs in the war efforts. Some people would be selected to go into the army, others to be into, into factories and others into um, leadership roles. And the history of intelligence testing is intertwined with the dubious and racist history of biological determinism that I've been talking about. You know, the measuring of heads and the measuring of brains and trying to extract conclusions about mental capacities from particular quantitative tests. I'm not going to go into intelligence testing and I'm not an expert, but I want you to consider whether the history of intelligence testing in psychology can really be separated from the history of biological determinism that I've been talking about. And this, this is a racist history. So a hundred years on from Galton, have we as psychologists adapted to the challenges and the difficulties of measuring IQ and other mental capacities cross-culturally? And my conclusion for today is going to be, no, we haven't properly adapted to these problems. And an example I'm going to give you is a paper that was published only a few months ago in the leading journal Psychological Science. Now, the article title was Declines in Religiosity Predict Increases in Violent Crime, but Not Among Countries with Relatively High Average IQ. So this article, a scientific paper from people currently working in, in Britain and elsewhere, noted that religious behaviour changes over time and in different countries. So people are generally sort of less religious than they used to be. He also noted that intelligence measurements, and they used, they used IQ, differs substantially across countries. They noted that as religious behaviour tends to decrease, murder rates in these same countries tends to increase. But they noted that this relationship was only present in countries with a low average IQ. 
and from their abstract they concluded that lower rates of religiosity were more strongly associated with higher homicide rates in countries with lower average IQ. Now, this article caused massive controversy in the scientific and the popular press, and the article was quickly retracted by the editors. And the reasons it, it was controversial, well, apart from the inherently racist or at least um, culturist conclusions, the underlying data was actually pretty poor. So a lot of the intelligence IQ data from these different countries actually came from very different, very poorly selected and very biased samples. For example, the data from one country might have been from a group of adolescents who'd gone through the asylum system in one country and they were they were chosen to represent the IQ of, of the country that they came from. So the underlying data were pretty poor, but the conclusions of the article essentially are that the people of some countries are less intelligent than other countries. And in those less intelligent people, when they become less religious, they become more violent and more murderous. I'm pretty shocked, actually, that this this was able to be published just a few months ago in you know one of the best journals for, in our in our field. It's it's pretty shocking, and it's shocking that this these papers are published without much comment at the time. Just people didn't think about the actual implications of what they're saying. So I've picked out some very highly controversial studies and criticisms from the 1800s and from 2020, and they are you know very highly selected. They're certainly not representative of the majority of work in psychology between that time. They possibly are representative of the 1800s. It did certainly seem to be a society where racist views were the popular views uh, and scientific racism was, was very much in popularity. But this one article from 2020 has been picked out just because it was controversial. So the question I want you to ask is, is psychology as a whole biased against certain cultures, countries, classes, sexes, or races? And I do not have an answer for you. But what I do suggest, and I think this goes for any issue across psychological topics, and particularly historical issues, you should be asking yourself about any claim in any paper that you read. Are the, are the methods used and the results and the conclusions made, are they reliable? Are they complete? Are they fair? And in cases where the topic, the subject matter might be sort of political or have a societal implications. Does this work seem to serve a political or a societal purpose rather than a purely scientific one? And should it, should our scientific papers be serving political or societal purposes? And I'm not, I'm not suggesting I know the answer to that. And when you read a piece of work, you've got to think about what was the dominant worldview or paradigm in science and society when the, when the work was done? So if you read a racist work from 1880, is that typical of its time or is it not typical? Is it a aberration? How was it received? Did the authors go on to publish the same thing, the same views many times? Or was it retracted by the editor within, you know, within weeks of publication? And you should ask for any paper, are the conclusions that they draw really justified by the data? Does the quality and completeness of the data really justify this conclusion? And maybe even more deeply, are you biased? So I do recommend reading the chapter by Stephen Gould. Um, it is difficult. It contains racist, very strong racist language, but it really, it really is worth reading. Um, so if you have any questions or comments at all, please post them um, on the question and answer session for um, for next week. And if you want to leave anonymous comments, I've also put a, a link to a place where you can do that 